Okay, fantastic. Welcome uh, to You Talking with Greg. I am thrilled uh, to have my guest here today, Thomas Sporkman. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me on your podcast. Absolutely. Well, it's a real honor. Uh, I want to say, I want to start this conversation with a big thank you. Um, I see you as a real visionary and leader and creating all sorts of energy uh, in the space that I think is super important. Um, so first, let me just thank you, uh, thank you. for all of that. Um, and maybe we can start a little bit with, so a couple of things I'd love for us to you know, dialogue a little bit about is, you know, you came out with an excellent book, The World We Create. I want to get to that a little bit, but maybe we could just start with a little bit of your history and the, your story about how you, you know, came into this space. Uh, you know, it's, it's got to be a fascinating journey. So I'm really, I don't know too much about it. I'd love to hear some. Sure. Thank you for asking. So um, uh, my background is really in, in, in business. Uh, I studied mathematics and physics at uh, university, and I thought at some point there that I would have a professional career as an academic. Um, but even though I loved to try to understand the world, and back then it was mainly from an naturalistic scientific perspective. Okay. Uh, I also felt the urge of uh, wanting to contribute to, to, to the world and change the world, perhaps Beautiful. even in, in, in a more tangible way, perhaps than uh, as you do as an academic, of, of right. course you, you are contributing it and changing the world as an academic as, as well. But I perhaps as a, 20 something found that process a little bit too slow. So, <laughs> Fair enough. I can empathize with that. <laughs> so, so, so I went too into slow, business. Too small. <laughs> yeah, could be, could be, could, could be great, but uh, def definitely a bit, a bit slower than the business world. So I, right. I went into business, started a number of, of business ventures, some small and unsuccessful, but at least three major ones in IT and in property and in banking. Okay. Um, sold my banking uh, business in 2006 mm. and had an opportunity then to sit back and think okay. about what to do with the second half of my life right. as I was uh, just about to turn 50 then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm. And I decided that I wanted to set up my own foundation right. in Sweden Yep. Uh, called the Oak Island Foundation, Eakvaret Foundation. Right. Um, really looking into the relationship between our personal inner development mm -hmm. and societal change. Wow. And to do that both from a theoretical mm -hmm. perspective, and as you mentioned, I, I've written a few books. I've written mm -hmm. The Market Myth, right. The Nordic Secret, together with uh, Lena Anderson, that I know that you've had on your um, channel. Yes. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, the the latest one, the the world we create, as you mentioned. Right. So um, yeah, I like to address this field from a theoretical perspective, mm -hmm. but perhaps even more from a practical perspective. Starting initiatives in this space, like conscious uh, or intentional communities, like intentional co-working space in Stockholm and in Berlin, a right. conscious, committed co-working co-living space in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Together with Jonathan Rawson, mm -hmm. I started Perspectiva uh, right. a couple of years. We'll get Jonathan uh, on so, the show here a little. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I regard myself as cert certainly uh, as as a thinker, but even more uh, as as a doer right. uh, in this space. And so I think important. that in in these uh, turbulent times, we we need to experiment a lot, and Absolutely. we can't think ourselves all the way to the solutions through emergence. So as much as need... I might want to, I can completely yeah. agree with you. Like, so we also I... we all, we also need to try, and I sometimes Absolutely. talk about building bridges into the fog. We don't really know what <laughs> if there is another side in the fog there, but we have to try to yeah we have to try to build bridges totally. into the fog. Right. Yeah. I, there's so much I have re resonates with me. Let me just make a few comments and see if you want to reflect on them. One is the inside development, outside development poll. Uh, one is the and so that's really fascinating to me. And I'd be curious um, if maybe you'd narrate about what you know 
it's not always the case that you, at least in my experience, maybe limited, but that sort of like seriously successful businessmen are also really deeply thinking about um, the underlying structure of the self and growth and how to create a societal vision that would afford that. So I really love the inside outside relation. I also love the theory and practice uh, and trying to understand and also explore. So those are really beautiful and sophisticated uh, frames uh, that obviously, you know, uh, as your life suggests, was remarkably successful. So I just, you know, would, can you re kind of reflect on what it was in you that led you to kind of those insights and have some uh, uh, of that guiding you? Yeah, yes. So, so uh, again, yes, I, I have been uh, driven by this entrepreneurial spirit, uh, uh, starting first businesses and, and now non-profit in, initiatives. Mm -hmm. But I've also always been driven by trying to understand the world mm -hmm. and going from natural science, from mathematics and physics into uh, the field of finance and, and economics. Mm -hmm. I found very early that the uh, standard models of, of economic thinking, the uh, neoclassical uh, mm -hmm. uh, economic modeling that uh, w was developed a hundred years ago and, and very much used the tools and mathematics of, mm -hmm. uh, of physics. Right. Uh, so it was really uh, uh, the standard way of understanding eco economics and the market is from a very naturalistic perspective. Yep. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you are dealing with social phenomena, and we might later on in the conversation come to your concept of the tree of knowledge, where this is absolutely so clear that when it comes to socially created phenomena like uh, the market, right. then a naturalistic perspective is a very limited perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and that got me very curious on mm -hmm. how to understand the market from uh, uh, a deeper perspective. Right. And I think if you are an, an entrepreneur, a business person trying to build a business within the, the finance world, mm -hmm. if you can really try to understand the world of finance mm. from a sociological or mm -hmm. psychological perspective, that of course helps you. That gives you an advantage mm. compared to if you are just trying to understand it from the more uh, uh, standard uh, economic perspective. So that, that was one thing. Mm -hmm. that, that, that was a little, little bit more the more theoretical approach to why I started to get interested in sociology and psychology and eventually philo philosophy as well. Right, right. Um, but uh, the more, from a more practical perspective, you could say that I had the opportunity to work with very uh, talented uh, leadership development consultants okay. mm -hmm. and uh, organizational development consultants mm -hmm. who showed me or us in, in the bank. And I was back then the chairman of a banking group in, in, in Scandinavia. And we worked with uh, organizational and leadership development consultants who really helped both myself and my management team first mm -hmm. and later on, even more people in our, in our bank organization to um, uh, grow and mature. Hmm. And through this inner growth programs, mm -hmm. I realized that that gave me and my management team both a better cognitive capacity to handle complexity and the dynamics of, of the world, mm -hmm. uh, but also expanded our emotional capacity mm. to hold uh, the complexity in the organization and relationships and Beautiful. and all of uh, and all of that. Right, right. Um, and then, of course, I I I thought something along these lines that if we in, in business start to know and understand the value of really focusing on this lifelong inner development and maturation journey. And we mm. see how important that is right. to support that growth, inner growth in, in a more and more complex business environment. Mm -hmm. 
how come that we are not at all talking about this in society? Right. <laughs> in society, we're talking about lifelong learning, but right. that's more of that, well, you might need to have to um, reschool yourself and become right. a programmer in, in the middle of your, of your life or something like that. But totally. no focus on this in a developmental journey. And then not to to repeat what you've been spoken to uh, uh, Leon Anderson um, about, but then of course later on uh, I realized a lot with the help of Lena how this focus in society on inner development how that had been key to right. our Nordic countries' Absolutely. successful transition from the pre-modern society into modernity, but then we sort of somehow forgot about this thing after the second world war or something like right. that. Right. So that got me into, into seeing the importance of the inner development, yes. but then also these uh, business consultants, they, they mm. showed us the importance of corporate culture mm. and the fact that uh, top management in any larger corporation has to have as one of the key priorities to really try to, to facilitate mm. a good corporate culture. Right. And if you get the corporate culture right, then most things will sort themselves mm. out. Mm -hmm. But if you don't get the corporate culture right, then it doesn't matter what new instructions, manuals, reorganizations you, you do. Right. Wow. And then again, the same question came to me. Well, if we understand the importance of corporate culture in business, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. why are we not at all talking about societal culture in the same way? Right. Saying that it might be one of the top priorities of the top management of our societies. Totally. To, 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 to look at the societal culture. Right. And then, of course, I don't mean that we should go back or we could go back or that we even should go back to these monocultures that we had yep. in, say, in the, in the Nordic countries in the 60s or in the 70s. Right. Well. That now we live in a multicultural society. Yep. But for me, and that's good news, because the more complex society becomes, the more perspectives we need on society. Yep. So, so that is not just a, a fact that we need to relate to. I think it's good news that we are living Amen. in a multicultural Amen. society. But then, of course, the focus on how to hold and create mm. a good multicultural society yes. becomes even more important. Unbelievable, yes. And the same in business world. If right. you are merging two business, if you're merging two banking organizations, then of course it becomes a very important task for the top management to manage these cultures. Yes. And of course, you might not want to just merge them. You might want to keep different brands and different cultures, right. but you need to do that very consciously. Totally. So I think that in the society today, we need to consciously create the right frame for the good multicultural society and that that will not just happen aut automatically. Amen, uh, brother. That's a, thank you. That's a thank beautiful you. summary. Thank you. And then finally, sorry for going on a bit, but- No, no this is exactly, this is brilliant. Fi finally then, uh, I started to think about that and, and also from these um, consultants and also experimenting a little bit by self, with self-organizing organizations and Frederick Laloux's reinventing organization and all of that, that there is a starting, we're starting to understand that th there is a relationship in an organization, for example, mm -hmm. between the maturity uh, of the people in the organizations mm -hmm. and how complex or ad advanced mm -hmm. corporate culture yes. that organization can hold. Yes. And there is probably the same relationship in society Agreed. between the maturity of the citizens in a society yep. and how complex a culture you, you would want to be, you would want to hold. Right. And especially if we are going into a multicultural, complex right. society, then we definitely also need to support the development, the personal inner development, mm -hmm. cognitive capacities, emotional capacities of all the citizens in a society, not just a few, right. but all the citizens, especially 
if we want to be able to preserve democracy. Mm. Mm. Amen. That's uh, so. So here's as I sit, so my trains in clinical psychology, and I'm a theoretical psychologist. Okay, so. The, what's remarkable to me is what you just described as your background in uh, the natural sciences, mathematics, and then into entrepreneurial business, and then understanding the organization, understanding the relationship of the organization and the society, the place and the maturity of the individual, the, the kind of comp- capacity of the ethos or, or whatever structure of the society that would then afford its complex, adaptive, and flexible growth. What's unbelievably remarkable to me is what you just lay out there is re- completely congruent uh, with the kinds of perspectives that uh, I look at when I'm looking at somebody's growth and development, their sense of maturity, the way they relate to their uh, body and to their heart or their emotional system, how it activates their cognitive head or justification system, the interface between those of how you want both systems with coherent integration um, and the relational space, both in specific relation and organizational relation, family and community, society, business. Um, so that it just speaks to me that there is really a process of potential to sync up across a wide variety of different domains of knowledge and then cultivate uh, wisdom uh, in terms of that affords the right kind of uh, development, growth, maturity, et cetera. So it's just super heartening to hear. That's, my, that's where you get my amens from. <laughs> Okay. Thank, thank you. And, and of course, the, the, the important realization is that this increased capacity that, that, we, that we can develop for, for handling the world both cognitively and emotionally, that is, of course, good for the individual. Totally. If, if, if we are going to be able to function in, in, in a rapidly developing business environment in a complex organization in the future, we need as individuals to develop these sorts of capacities. Okay? Absolutely. But at the same time, it's also necessary for the functioning of, of society. Right. And, and if we should be able to move our Western democracy into the next level of democracy where we can hold these more the, the, the new complex world yes. that is e- emerging and that is causing so much um, anxiety and, and, and tension in, in, in the world, then this is also a necessity for our society. And, right. and the key here was that, again, referring to Linus and my book, The Nordic Secret, yes. and the concept of Bildung, right. that this was the remarkable insight. Yep by the Bildung philosophers, the German Bildung philosophers in the beginning of the, totally. of the 1800s, like Schiller, Goethe, yep. Herder, von Humboldt, Hegel. They knew that Absolutely. this relationship between the personal inner development and societal development was super important, totally. both to understand, but also to foster. And they called the, the fostering of that inner development for Bildung. Absolutely. And, and I've been a big fan of what you guys do put out with Nordic Speaker. I always tell them, lean, lean we have a building Bildung over here in the States, you know, because uh, one thing we do not know how to do, uh, I don't think very well in our education is, is cultivate character education, cultivate emotional, cognitive, moral maturity across a wide variety of different mm-hmm. domains. See oneself as a responsible, understand what personal responsibility is, understand what social commitment is, understand what the interface between those is. We, we cannot weave that thread together, I'm sorry no, to say. But, but, um, but you do have, you do have uh, in, the, in the US, the, the academic transition, uh, tradition uh, of um, uh, transformative education. There is that. Uh, yeah, uh, Mitzerov. I forgot about his. I forgot his first name, but Mitzerov uh, and, and transformative education and transformative education and building are quite quite close totally. concepts In because fact, it, it, it's all about yep. these deeper psychological processes and it's not about the content of your mind. It's more about the capacity and the depth of your mind and developing that. Absolutely. To see the synchrony there, in fact, the whole birth of this crazy thing called the garden happened in 2016. I was at a conference uh, that was being hosted by my colleagues on transformative education, international approaches Mm -hmm. to transformative education called Cultivating the Globally Sustainable Self. 
Um, okay, good, uh, good. And and the question, the panel discussion that was under consideration was, well, what does this actually mean? Um, and I had built this thing called the Unified Theory of Psychology and the Unified Approach, and uh, I was, they were jammed together in the in called the ATUA model, the UT UA, and I was going around, you know, ATUA. And an African scholar got up and talked about what's called Ubuntu. Ubuntu mm -hmm. uh, is a toward you as me and be, creates a relational space. Uh, Nelson Mandela was influenced by Ubuntu. And, and actually in the context of him articulating how to cultivate the globally sustainable self from an African perspective of Ubuntu, I said, hey, we should plant a two of seeds and grow a two of seed trees. <laughs> And that was the, literally the light bulb moment. It was like, oh my God. And then what that does is what it affords potentially the opportunity would be like, well, if you can then create a, a, an interactive structure, like, could you imagine like a preschool that's structured around a garden that has all sorts of kinds of things you could get children involved in it. And then their participatory learning would be encapsulated in an entire ecology that would then grow both into the logos of learning and the participatory phrenesis mm. of, of yeah. wise uh, living. And that yeah. was uh, all part of sort of where the, so the, the inspiration. And then when I learned about Bildung, I was like, oh gosh, you know, uh, you know, this transformational education thing both goes back a fairly long time, at least in modern society and has the record of success with the Nordic cultures in a way that is really inspiring. And you can go even further back. You can go back to the Greek concept of pedia. Um, so, I mean, this, this understanding. And then we can go into all the religious traditions and the spiritual and the mystic traditions that, that have all understood the importance of, of the, cultivating this inner development, um, conscious development, or whatever name uh, different uh, movements have, have given to this phenomena that we our mind has this as astonishing capacity to uh, continue evolving through, throughout our, our lives and to build an inner complexity. Right. And, it, and it's this inner complexity that we need in order to be able to meet the outer complexity. Right. And, and, and say a hundred years ago or, or even a couple of thousand years ago, then perhaps it was enough that in, in each tribe back then or in each society right. that you had a few elders mm -hmm. who had developed this capacity and could yep. take sort of the big view and the long-term mm -hmm. responsibility for the tribe or for the, mm -hmm. for the city. Whereas now mm -hmm. we live in this dynamic and complex world where we cannot rely on just a few individuals developing this capacity late in life. We need to support the development of this capacity in many people as early as possible uh, in life, of course. Right. And the complexity and how to do that. And this is another topic I'd like to move in. So in 2011, when I wrote my book, A New Unified Theory of Psychology, I set it up and I called it, hey, it's kind of ironic, but I mean this sincerely. I said, and this will come back to play twists. Uh, and I said, hey, it's a post postmodern grand meta narrative that fosters an integrated pluralistic view of the world. That was my 2011 view. Okay, okay that was early. Uh, and then in 2018 or whatever, when my started get twirled into this space that you are such a uh, sort of an influential, constructive uh, visionary around, I then stumbled across this concept called metamodernity or metamodern. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I know that's something that you have a, a lot to say about the kind of culture and sensibility that maybe we can cultivate in the 21st century. Can you share your uh, concept and, and thoughts about metamodern? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think I, I think other people in, in our ecosystem could perhaps do that uh, uh, better than I, but I could uh, just say that I believe that we as a civilization, the Western civilization, probably the global civilization, mm -hmm. that, that we are in one of these um, transition mm -hmm. periods right. that humanity has gone through many, many times mm -hmm. uh, in the history mm -hmm. and that uh, the study of big history, the history of a very large uh, uh, eras of, of time and trying to recognize these patterns mm -hmm. become very important. And I think more and more people now 
especially after after uh, Trump uh, storming of the Capitol, mm-hmm. Brexit, the mm-hmm. Corona pandemic. Um, more and more people are starting to understand that we are in in transitional totally. space. Mm-hmm. So five years ago, uh, I had to try to convince people that that we were entering in, in a transition. Now I think that is 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 obvious. Yes. But then the question comes: How deep will this transition be? Mm-hmm. And um, I think it will be at least as deep as the uh, uh, Enlightenment transition, Mm -hmm. when we went from uh, um, a dogmatic religious worldview Mm -hmm. into a uh, scientific rationalistic worldview. Uh, That has served humanity tremendously well Mm -hmm. during a couple of hundreds of years and giving us... uh, Concepts like um, democracy, mm-hmm. human rights, mm-hmm. given us modern medicine and all of these things that we would never want to be without. Mm-hmm. But I also think that it's quite clear that this crisis that we are in is on such a deep level that we are again going through a, a shift in worldview, totally. uh, a shift in epistemology. And that the Enlightenment worldview will have to be replaced. Perfect. And then coming back to your post postmodern thinking there. So you could say that during the Enlightenment, we went from a pre modern world mm-hmm. into a modern world. And right. again, the Nordic secret is, is about how we in Scandinavia actually saw that transition and managed that transition through large scale consciousness development in most places of the world that transition was not managed right but 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 managed or facilitated or supported but it was consciously supported in scandinavia through this build on concept yes uh, so that was the transition from the pre modern into modernity yep and the modern world view yep and some decades ago in the in the 70s and 80s and 90s in philosophy, that there, there was a, a realization of the fact that this scientific worldview, rationalistic worldview, uh, had its limitations, totally. and that is the postmodern critique yep. Yep. of of uh, modernity, yep. and 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 that was a very valid, is a very valid Agreed. critique, mm-hmm. and and we need to take all of those insights on board. Yes, that that for example, that natural science is just one perspective mm-hmm. on the world. It's a very strong, mm-hmm. but limited yes. perspective of the world that our uh, human world to a very large extent is a socially constructed world. Mm-hmm. It's not a natural world. Mm-hmm. My favorite example there is that the market is not a natural phenomenon. Right. Amen. It's a social construct. Yes. It's a fairly recent social construct. Mm-hmm. And as a social construct, it could be very, very different. So we can't really study the market as a natural phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. And that's also very important in postmodern insights. And so are many others. But the, the postmodern philosophy is mainly, if not only, a deconstructing critique of modernity. That's right. And at some point, we need to move on just critiquing Yep. modernity and constructing some something new and really? and that new will then be post postmodern thinking and of course you can give that many names you can call that a more holistic thinking you can call that integral thinking mm-hmm. or you could call that a meta modern thinking totally. and 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 out of that thinking out of the modernistic thinking mm-hmm. came a modern society yep out of a meta-modern thinking, yes. we can hope that a meta-modern society might come and, and um, re- replace yeah. the, 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 modern society, the modern society. Mm. Uh, and what that will look like, I don't think anybody knows, because um, per definition, these deeper societal transitions, yep. they, they are emergent. 
me meaning that we cannot really know yes. what is going to emerge. Also yeah. meaning that we cannot manage mm -hmm. and plan and manage, project manage yep. such a transition. Mm -hmm. But we can probably facilitate mm. the, the transition. Right. And perhaps increase the possibility of a successful transition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we should know that when our societal system, and here I think it's very, very helpful to use complexity science and understand societal evolution as a self-organizing complex system. Totally. It's also very useful to understand that way of thinking when it comes to thinking about our mind mm -hmm. and not confusing our mind with our brain, but to see the mind as a self-organizing developing system that during our lifetime takes in energy and information yep. and can go through these phase transitions. Totally. And that explains why we can take these almost leaps in consciousness development mm -hmm. throughout life, because it is the complex system of the mind reorganizing its meaning making totally. around, around new principles. Mm. Okay. And, and for example, John David is explaining that very, very well. And professor Robert Keegan with yeah. his theories of our, of our, of the development of our, of our mind and our meaning making. Amen. But if we look at society, so society is also a self-organizing system like this. Yeah. Yeah. And when a self-organizing system like this, is under developmental pressure, you, you sooner or later, you come to a point mm -hmm. where incremental adjustment mm -hmm. is not possible any longer. Mm -hmm. You come to what some complexity science uh, uh, thinkers call a, a bifurcation point yes. or a phase shift point. It requires a phase shift, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and at that point, the system is really facing either a breakdown Yep. Or a breakthrough. That's right. I, either you have the capacity to reorganize on a higher level of complexity, mm -hmm. which is also, in many cases, a more elegant way. So it's yep. more complex, but also more elegant way of organization. Mm -hmm. Or you have a decrease, That's a right. fragmentation of complexity, mm -hmm. and the system breaks down. Totally. And in most cases in our history, when civilizations have faced, so have reached their end of their, their developmental logic, mm -hmm. come to this bifurcation point, mm -hmm. th they have disintegrated. Mm -hmm. Even the Roman Empire broke down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in history so far, even with the big breakdowns like the Roman Empire, that didn't affect the totality of humanity. Right. And it right. didn't affect the planet as a right. whole. Whereas now with a global civilization and the way our civilization is impacting the climate, it might be that at this point that a breakdown would mean a total breakdown of, of human civilization and even a planetary yep. uh, breakdown or, 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 or setback. So whereas in, in history, we, we have sort of managed this, development more or less by trial and error, not self-consciously trying to facilitate that. Right. Now we are at a situation where we can't afford that. Totally. We, we need to self-reflexively see the situation where humanity is at, at this moment. And, and somehow, even though we can't plan it, we yep. can't manage it, we can't sort of mm -hmm. top-down manage this, we could still look at possibilities to uh, facilitate mm. the transition and increase the odds of a positive emergence. And then, of course, the question comes, and I could ask you that question. Mm -hmm. So what can we do? What can we do to facilitate and right. support the positive emergence, even though we haven't got a clue what is <laughs> coming on the other side yeah. of the phase shift? Well, uh, yeah. Um, wonderful set up uh, and, and, and a beautiful question. And I think you've already created a lot of framing uh, that just resonates very deeply with me. I, ha I have my uh, ways of responding to that and I'll get that to just a sec. But um, I do, as I told you, I like to stick in this comment sure. and this sure. is a good comment that um, 
I, I think we are at a very chirotic moment, to use a John Verveke term. The time mm-hmm. is now. And what happens now, we'll have this. We are at a bit of a bifurcation. We are at a potential phase shift that then creates also a lot of vulnerability for collapse. Uh, I, I do feel the heaven and hell uh, kind of experience of, oh, my gosh, we, if we make it, the elegant potential for our fulfillment. And if we don't, the magnitude of global civilization collapse feel very, very strong. Um, and, and there's a lot of issues that we need to solve, but one of the ways that we are looking is to think about conscious evolution, to grab a hold of something like Bill Dong, uh, and the idea of a transformation and wonder about a metamodern society. And for me, one of the ways I could frame that is that we are searching for a coherent naturalistic ontology uh, that can revitalize the human soul and spirit in the 21st century. Um, and that sounds a lot about uh, pretty similar to what you've been <laughs> yes. kicking around for the last 15 years, at least, or, or more uh, in no. relationship to that. So then the issue is, well, okay, what now, we certainly can't top-down control it. I'd be very concerned about any system that could do that. Um, but it's at the same time, you know, I'm a clinical psychologist. Um, so for me, I see a lot of systems in uh you know, that get trapped and then get defensive and have partial understandings, but then they lock down and, and narrowing, but then that creates vicious cycles. And that's, uh, that's a dangerous domain. When people have understanding both of what the problem and realistic hope about what they're moving towards, and they can get their bodies on board and their hearts on board and mm-hmm. their minds on board sort of vertically, and then see a relational system that has that shared understanding of both the problem and the valued ground they want to move towards, then humans historically have been able to achieve an enormous amount when that framing. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, and, and so. I think it's important this connection you you did also with, with our with our bodies here, be, because what you just mentioned that the search for a, co- a coherent ontology that is definitely my first step in in what I would argue could help support this. Uh, this transition, we, we need to develop a new worldview, meaning that we need to develop a new, a new way to, to see our relationship with ourselves, with each other, with society right. and, we, and, and with the planet. Yep. So part of this is a new worldview yep. that, that could be communicated and learned. Yep. Um, and we are seeing part of, the, of an understanding of a new world already emerging things like we 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 need to not stop looking at ourselves as just isolated individuals uh, maximizing our own uh, utility uh, function definitely Uh, definitely. so so we are (laughs) individuals economic man is you know yes yes home economic but it's also like uh, home economic And, and and we are individuals and we should respect and we should cherish that fact but we are also interconnected totally. and interconnected so much more than we have understood before in, in so many ways. So totally. going from this individualistic perspective to the interconnected when interrelated um, perspective is part of this shift in worldview. Totally. Another, another shift is as we just did stop looking at the world from an atomistic uh, analytic perspective where we are mainly seeing the world through the lens of things yep. and start to look at the world as processes. Totally. Where ve- very many of these processes are self-organizing developmental right. Right. processes. Yep. Another shift is going from the view of our mind as a rational machine, mm-hmm. the enlightenment view of Locke's blank slate and disguised machine to realize that our mind is also a, a constantly developing process Complex and that that developmental system. process, yeah, yeah, adaptive mm-hmm. system, seeing our culture and society, not as something given, but right. something created and recreated yes. by ourselves mm. and so on. I mean, there are many totally. parts of, of an emerging worldview that, that, that we can, that we can see, but this cognitive shift is only one part. Right. Then I think when you were mentioning, um, that this needs to be embodied, that then uh, I would say that the cognitive worldview shift needs to be supported by and complemented by 
developing our inner capacities. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and that's where this uh, sort of transformative education comes Total. in. How can we cultivate these abilities? Completely. For example, the, our ability for compassion. Yep. We, we are not born with a certain amount of compassion. <laughs> Science shows clearly that compassion is something that can be developed. Yep. But, but you can't just send someone on a three-day course in <laughs> compassion and then they come Check back. Check the boxes and now exactly got a dip- soul. <laughs> got, a, got a diploma. No? Right. So, so that is the challenge, that many of these capacities need this sort of transformative learning building approach to, to, to the thing. And that could be capacity for empathy, both extending empathy and deepening empathy. It could be our capacity for perspective taking, totally. seeing more perspectives, seeking more perspectives, mm-hmm. holding more perspectives at the same time, even yep. conflicting perspectives, mm-hmm. deeper sense making, mm-hmm. more nuanced sense making, yes. deeper meaning making, mm-hmm. connecting with our inner compass. Mm-hmm. becoming self-authoring yep. in the language of uh, Professor Robert Keegan, mm-hmm. stop being in a socialized mind, depending constantly on the mm-hmm. outer support yep. from an authority yep. for your values and your worth, mm-hmm. but starting to generate that from an inner mm-hmm. point. Cultivate yeah. a post-conventional view of exactly. oneself that transcends exactly. that. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. So we have many of these inner capacities totally. that, that we need to cultivate. So right. change your worldview, cultivate inner capacities. And then the third step, I would say, is experimenting. Mm-hmm. Daring to experimenting. Go out there in the world and do small experiments. Experimenting by building communities, organizing business and organizations in new way, new types of leadership, alternative currencies. Yeah, just experiment. And then we'll see what will work and what will, will not work. Total. So that, that I have a three, at least three yeah, ways yeah. of trying to, right. without knowing what's happening, at least mm-hmm. supporting right. the, the odds and, for a positive emergence. And, and, and you are, you have your hands in a number of those things. There's like the 29K project. There's you foster yeah. Rebel Wilson for, yeah. con, for cultural conversation. There's yeah. perspective. Yeah. Yeah, 29K is, impo- uh, is interesting that you mentioned that because this cultivation of these inner capacities, mm-hmm. of course, I think from my foundation and we have our own retreat island outside Stockholm, the Oak Island, Ekvaret, where, where we host youth camps and adult retreats to try to foster these inner capacities. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that there is any better way of doing that than by spending a lot of time, preferably out in nature with a group of people that you can really trust and you have the authentic meetings and dialogue. Right. But that does not scale easily. Right. And now we need to support not just a couple of thousand individuals on this journey, mm-hmm. but millions. Yep. So, so th- that is why my foundation has teamed up with uh, another foundation in, in Stockholm, the Norwegian Foundation, mm. a technology for good tra- uh, foundation, yep. and trying to, de- to develop a digital platform yep. to support the inner development of these uh, Capacity. So you could call that a little bit of a digital building uh, project. Mm -hmm. So this is a nonprofit, open source, Mm -hmm. co-created platform where a lot of researchers and practitioners uh, are able to upload their interventions. Right. Then a lot of people can come on the platform Mm -hmm. and use these interventions to learn and develop. And as a lot of people are on the platform learning and developing, Mm -hmm. the platform is also learning and developing yep. and seeing what intervention is best for what person at what stage in, totally. in, in, their, in their life journey. And video sharing, just like we do now, video right. sharing in small well, groups is the key component in that totally. platform. Right. We were actually trying to build a similar, you know, just at least on an idea level, this thing called We Thrive, We, I, It, and Together Create Wellbeing. And the idea was video pods uh, that people would uh, generate. So, so cool uh, to see that kind of development and and that kind of infrastructure. Uh, Yeah. And I think this is these video conversations that we have and the fact that we can now connect in a way that is very similar to an authentic meeting. I mean, we've been able to speak to, to other people on the other side of the, of the earth on telephone for, for, mm-hmm. 
for quite some time, nope. but a telephone call cannot come close to the authentic meeting in a small group. Completely. But what we have found is that the quality of video conferencing now is able to, to replicate yes. that connection. That's my sense, exactly. Yeah. So um, that, that, that is a very important technological step, I think, for, for humanity to come together as a, um, as a whole humanity, that we have now this possibility to connect. I'm right now in, in, in Stockholm and you are in the, in the US and yep. it's almost like sitting in the same room. It, it, totally. It's unbelievably yeah. uh, valuable. And I do believe, you know, Zoomtopia <laughs> or whatever yeah. this is, uh, this kind of part of what happened was it was on the cusp of happening, but then with COVID, you know, accelerated this new capacity. And if we uh, adjust this new cor capacity correctly, this is exactly the kind of global technological and intimate connection that can somehow be risen together uh, that would afford uh, sort of the best of the best in terms of uh, minimizing travel, minimizing demand and stress, and at the same time affording the kind of human relational connection that we can uh, and then yeah. <laughs> almost yeah, in the same room. <laughs> yes, saying that, and then we have the right first glitch. All of a sudden, the first little glitch. I was like, oh, the first, the first glitch. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, the gods are tracking the conversation. Yeah, so, exactly. Uh, you know. um, one of the things I did want to circle bound, maybe where we could, because I didn't quite uh, fully answer the question in that you sort of set up, and that's that we've had some really good conversations about the tree of knowledge. And one of the things that I, um, I very appreciate your uh, the the synergy between the world we create that uh, uh, book that you had and uh, the tree of knowledge and our visions. I think is worth us circling, you know, to some space around. So, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that I'll I'll, I'll see how this uh, resonates with you, and I'll tell a little bit of my story here in relation, uh, and see how it sort of fits in some of these. Um, so one of the obvious bridges that we've now connected is just in practice is sort of like as a psychologist that's emphasizing both personal development, adjust, you know, war, war, how to cultivate a healthy adaptation, optimal growth uh, out of some of the neurotic, uh, you know, difficulties that's obviously relevant and how to bridge it from a scientific uh, coherent kind of perspective. Um, so that's that we share that sentiment. Now, what happened to me in terms of my own professional development um, that makes, I think, sort of our kind of connection really fascinating, uh, given your background in the natural sciences. is So I, I'm in the process of like learning behavioral science, you know, um, and, and I like, oh, and I want I want to apply that to the concept of psychology, human behavior, animal behavior, whatever. And I learned the methods of science uh, as an undergraduate. Um, and I find how powerful they are and how good they are as an epistemological system, meaning that they, you know, the way you quantify stuff and you control for stuff and you apply mathematics and then you try alternative explanations relative to just common sense. Um, and then I wanna bring that to the therapy room, okay? Because we've, we did gather some knowledge, but what happens to me is then when I go actually into the therapy room, the fragmented research findings of uh, the, uh, si the science of psychology um, actually then were unbelievably less useful to me uh, when I moved into the actual real world of practice, okay? Just like me when I moved into the real world of science. Okay. Totally, yeah. very yeah. similar. And then I was like, well, wait a minute. I looked at the talented people that could understand both the, the social context and the person and bring their knowledge to that. And I looked across the landscape, saw a lot of talented people and just sort of had this weird intuition. I was like, well, we should have a science that organizes this. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But it turns out there isn't. <laughs> so that's what, what I then re, sort of rediscovered is then the problem of psychology. Uh, and it turns out, you know, as a natural scientist, you probably have this sense like, well, we got physics, we got chemistry, then we have biology and into neuroscience, and then it all goes to hell. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay? And the reason actually it all goes to, well, there are lots of reasons. One is, you know, the human world is very complicated and all of this. Um, but I discovered actually part of the reason it goes to hell is precisely because modernity the meaning the way in which really the science and philosophy of modernity, they never really figured out uh, sort of the proper way to map big history, as it were. 
you know, they never figured out the way to get the frame on what the material universe was, how it evolved, uh, how yeah. you kind of hold the human knower and create a continuity of understanding between those blocks. No, um, no, no. Um, and what no, the, no, they, they had problems. They had problems. Uh, they, with that. They, they, had, they had problems in, in, in that because with, with the, uh, let, let us call it the, the, the Newtonian perspective, uh, nope. of of the world uh, the the world is a continuum mm -hmm. uh, the, the world never makes a jump yep uh, is, is a quote uh, and I don't remember who who said it but it's sort of the, the world is a continuum mm -hmm. and, and, and that is also a um, an important assumption for the Newtonian mathematics calculus mm -hmm. to uh, to work that 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 it is a continu that everything is continuous mm -hmm. and it's only when you start and i don't know if you had that approach but that was my approach to to this it's only when you leave newtonian uh, physics and you start to use complexity science right. and, and and the understanding again of self-organizing right. systems, yep. because then you understand the importance of, again, emergence. That's right. Uh, and we were talking about emergence, that we are in an emergent societal transition here right yep. now. Exactly. But, but when you look at the big history of the evolution of the universe, right. and you were mentioning uh, the evolution of the particles and physics, and yep. then more complicated compounds, you need chemistry, and then you need biology. And there you have something called life. So what, yes. what, what, what happened there? Yeah, and then right. you have the evolution of nervous systems right. and, and brains. That's and right. then all of a sudden you have a mind. That's right. Something happened <laughs> there. And, and then probably all higher animals have some sort of mind. But then with the human mind, we have self-reflexiveness and the possibility to take some of our ideas and put them into society totally. to make the ideas have a life of their own That's right. that is independent of any specific members right. of this society. That's and right. then we have the emergence of culture. That's right. And of course, when you start to see that each of these steps, mm -hmm. in each of these steps, there is this phenomenon of emergence. Yep. That something new yes. has arisen. Right. That in the case of life, if we take the emergence of life, yeah. it's still just particles and atoms and, and uh, molecules, yep. even if it's large molecules. There is nothing else there. There is no <laughs> Elan Vital or no something. Elan Vital. No. no, or something like that. It, it, it is just these things. But through their complex interaction and relationship, yep. Yep. some new qualities emerge. That's right. And those new qualities even if they emerge from these particles, yep. cannot be reduced and fully explained That's right. at the lower level. Exactly. And that is why chemistry can never fully explain biology, and we need biology. And, and that is why psychology, psychology is needed to explain and understand our mind, and it cannot be reduced to uh, uh, biology. Right. And why we need sociology. Yep. And other tools to understand our society, because we need psychology to understand society, but society is something more. Totally. Has got emergent components That's beyond right. uh, psychology. That's right. And when you start to see this, then of course, and this is really you who should say this, because this is absolutely clear in, in your model and, and the theory there. But of course, when, when these new phenomena emerge, it's not strange that you need new ways of understanding these new phenomena. So, so that is why you need different scientific approaches. 
to understand it. And my in my world, you, you, you had this uh, realization from working in psychology. I had my first realization by working in finance and in the market that you cannot reduce a social phenomenon like the market just to Newtonian uh, uh, mathematics, right. which is what neoclassical economic thinking is, is trying to do. That's what it tries to do. You, you can capture some aspects, but the reduction is to... Uh, too rough. Okay. You are losing. You are losing too many dimensions. Yep. If, you, if you are trying to do uh, to do that, brilliant. Yeah. Mm. So that's exactly basically the insight that I had. And 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 with the tree tree of knowledge formulation, what it what it says is that there is emergence within. So there is a there's you go to physics from physics to chemistry, you get emergent properties. Um, but those are within dimension emergence. Okay. Something, the quote magical thing that happens at the life dimension is really this information processing communication network system. And when you get information processing to really kind of a epistemic function, like there's a knowledge function inside of a cell that Newtonian stuff doesn't really have a great frame for it. And that's that complex adaptive self-organizing network that's metabolizing not just energy, but it's metabolizing information. And it then gets networked with other information processors to create a communication web. And that creates this plane of complex adaptive um, existence we call life, you know? Mm. Um, and that's relatively well stood, although the metaphysics of life still, because we got stuck in Newtonian mechanics, our metaphysics of that are still wobbly. But Darwin's theory of natural selection and genetics and the way in which the cell processes information and the distinction between life and um, the material world, that's like natural science has a pretty good handle on that. Uh, and our scientific sensibility is pretty good. I like to reference E.O. Wilson's consilience, uh, the unity of knowledge. And he, he lays that out pretty well. What's really interesting, though, is we don't have a good vocabulary for understanding what I call the joint point between life and mind, like exactly how, and then mind and culture. But if you apply the information processing communication network to give rise to complex adaptive system idea, then you see the nervous system and the complex adaptive behavior of animals, kind of Aristotle saw this, really becomes uh, the mind animal dimension. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that goes from pretty simple things like crabs all the way up to you know, very complex social animals like chimpanzees. Um, and then that lays the set, set up for us as primates um, to then create networks of initially coordinated social behavior and intuition and mind reading and felt sense of being in a we space. Um, and then ultimately we get to create that landscape, start symbolic talking and then propositional talking. Well, propositional talking that's a whole nother game changer because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. now we start to build the systems of justification that we can give reasons for our actions. And these reasons for our actions then grow to coordinate. Mm -hmm. and, and, the and, and starting to construct ideas, concepts, and words yep. that, that do not have any resemblance directly in the outer world. It's a totally different uh, yeah. domain. So it's, one, it, it's one thing when, when we were talking and perhaps some, even some animals can have different sounds right. to warn the other oh, definitely. animals yeah. for different kinds of predators or, yep. or, or dangers. And we can talk as, as early humans about a, a stone or an animal or a river totally. or something that is really out there. But when we are starting to construct these abstract uh, concepts, yeah. like uh, or what we said, not not just a, partic a particular um, animal like an antelope, yep. but you talk start talking about animals in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we start forming concepts like families and, and tribes. That's right. And then you get into even more complex uh, concepts like justice. Mm -hmm. So justice does not at all exist out there. Mm -hmm. So our understanding of that term is, is something that is not just in my mind, mm -hmm. but it has to be 
in our collective a collective just a narrative yeah. understanding yeah yeah and then now we are starting by through this language to construct a world yep. that is uniquely human totally. and at the deepest level there are some sociologists calls this that we have the ability to to construct that is even deeper than culture our collective imaginary yep mm-hmm. so that is sort of the if if we can if we compare that with our conscious it's really like our deepest individual subconscious mm-hmm. things that we are not even aware of ourselves and in the same way in our societal culture we have these deep layers of our collective imaginary Absolutely. that affects us all in the way that we see and we perceive the world totally. but we are we are just absorbing this unknowingly right and to connect this with this societal transition that we are in mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think this transition is that deep that in order for us to successfully navigate it, we have to collectively go down to the level of our collective imaginary and, and have to reshape that. So, so society has to be reshaped not only on the institutional level, yep. not only on the cultural level, but even on the collective imaginary level. And and that's a level that we are usually never talking about because we haven't really reconstructed that level for uh, at least uh, 500 years or something like that. Totally. No, yeah. uh, that's a those are those are the foundational architects and architectures uh, yeah. that frame our self-conscious thought and to be aware of what those structures are. Absolutely, yeah. and how to map yeah. them and frame that, yeah. and to recognize one of the things that the tree of knowledge teaches us. I mean, uh, I you know I tell the story that in I, you know, I, I popped onto the idea one night in 1997, um, but within a year of it, six months of it, because I had layered out this idea that we had these information processing communication network systems. Okay, uh, And so, for example, like in the transition to animals, um, 600 million years ago, we have just like jellyfish, like a distributed neural network. Okay, uh, But it's not consolidated into a brain and it's not doesn't have complex active body parts like a crab. But what you go through in the Cambrian explosion uh, is a, you know, a period of 20 million years, which is not a long time at this time in geologic time. You get the Cambrian explosion, you go from jellyfish basically all the way up to crabs, which is really fast. This, is, this happens very, very dramatically. And, and then we try to, a lot of people are trying to understand that explosion. And basically it's, it's a sequence of bilateral movement that then requires better and better movement that requires better and better control systems. And that gives rise to the, the nervous system and brain and a complex active body, a networked information processing system that then communicates, okay? So if we take that analogy and we look at the 20th century and we are, we're, we're talking creatures, but we're now what we did is we turned our material culture into a new, we laid the groundwork for a new kind of information processing system. We built Absolutely. artificial intelligence, we built the internet, we built interface systems with it. And so that's like the cosmic jellyfish of the 20th century. And then we're going to go through the equivalent of a Cambrian explosion into the digital. I mean, that's what it suggests in the 21st uh, century. So at a, just at a, just eyeballing the basic map, it basically says, hey, we're at like this fifth. We're going to, what will the digital virtual global networked world with artificial intelligence, human interface look like? Well, yeah. we don't know, but we know yeah, that. And, and, what we, and, and what will be our human role totally. in, in that? Uh, and, and both in the end state, well, what, what will it mean to be human there? And again, what sort of inner capacities do we need to cultivate to be able to fulfill a meaningful human role in that world? Right. But also, what will our human role be in that transition? Because this is not, this is not just something that is happening to us. Mm-hmm. This is part of the world we create. Exactly. Yeah. So whether, whether, evolution is so yeah, central, whether, right? whether, whether we are aware of it or not. Yes, it's happening. We are the, we, no, it's not just happening. I mean, right. We are the agents. We are happening. Uh, yeah, we are happening. <laughs> it, we are happening. It. We are the agents of that step in evolution right. yeah whether we are conscious of it or or not right so we better be conscious mm-hmm. of it otherwise this transition will have us rather than we are having the transition 
Ah. We don't want this to be just happening to us. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Wow, that's uh, that's a really nice ride. I think as we if we look at the uh, just sort of the arc of this, maybe we'll uh, begin to wrap this up. But I, given that this sort of brings us to the cuffs, uh, uh, when you look out, out over the horizon, Thomas, in terms of your either optimism or pessimism or the kinds of seeds that you see have been planted. Um, what are you looking at? What are you, what are you feeling? What are you uh, anticipating as things unfold? Hmm. Yeah. We're living in interesting times. <laughs> <Aren't we? laughs> We're living in interesting times. And, and of course, I'm, I mean, no, I'm, I'm optimistic. Okay. I am optimistic. Uh, um, but, but not naively. So th th there is certainly a, a chance, as we said earlier, of, of a total civilizational uh, um, collapse. Yeah. And of course, what I, what, what I see, I, I, um, I have my main residence in, in, in London and through the uh, Brexit period now, not, not the least uh, uh, since um, the, uh, the new year, mm -hmm. um, I see a lot of fear in the society. Okay. And if you look at the US and this, again, the storming of the capital and things like that, I mean, there's, there is so much fear in society mm. and so much of our actions today mm. are driven by fear mm -hmm. and large portions of our societies are driven by fear. Mm -hmm. and, and that is of course not good news mm -hmm. and much, much more so today than perhaps 20 or 30 years ago. That's my sense, yep. Yeah, so, so that, that is of course bad news. But then at the same time, paradoxically, mm -hmm. I also see an awakening happening. Uh, it's a marginal one. It's, it is super small. Mm -hmm. we, we are perhaps talking about uh, less than a percent mm -hmm. of the population. Okay. But this awakening, is uh, picking up speed by the day. Mm. So, so again, go, going back five years or even just three years, when, when we were talking about um, the need for, for uh, a societal transformation mm. and that such a societal transformation might need to start with individual personal transformation, right. Right. That, that was very esoteric language. Mm. <laughs> uh, and most people around me, even my intellectual friends, mm. most of them would still five or three years ago say something like, Thomas, you, 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 this is really radical mm. talk. You know, take it a little bit easy. We, <laughs> we have the market and we have the democracy and it is a bumpy road, but right. just give it some time. Things mm. will sort itself out. Mm. I don't hear that any longer. N not, not at least amongst my intellectual friends, so, so to say. That now there is a, a more or less a general understanding that that th this what we are experiencing right now will will not be sorted. It will not sort itself out just being left to itself. The present implementation of the market and the present implementation of of, of democracy. Right. Uh, I certainly hope and believe that we will have some sort of market system governing the world in 30 years and that democracy will still be the, the, right. the governing principle of, of the West and hopefully the world, mm. but it will have to be in, in the updated uh, versions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And luckily both democracy and the market are human made systems and constructs right we can we can so tweak they, them potentially yeah so we created them <laughs> and we can re, we can recreate them but, but this particular form of 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 democracy for example with the interconnection with campaign financing and the media dynamics and how all of this i mean no, forget it the, the, this will not work yes <laughs> this will not this will not work so th that's where my optimism uh, comes from mm. that there is this awakening on right. the margin. So the big question is if if we through conversations like like this and right. through programs of inner development and by developing new philosophical thinking about a new paradigm and a new world, if, if that process 
can be quick enough and the awakening can be quick enough to mm. counterbalance this sort of spread of fear or if our societies will gravitate to right. to the fear driven side and that will drag us into a place where we where we do not want to uh, go right uh, i'll yeah. say that as a clinical psychologist that's a brilliantly <laughs> stated uh thing there's a realistic hope uh, and a defensive structure that fragments and uh, yeah. so that's a that's a brilliant and uh, it really resonates. I, I certainly feel I look at the last five years and where I was and who I was talking with uh, and where things are now. And it really does feel like this um, hopeful transitioning and hopeful awakening uh, is is happening. It does feel like there's more energy in some of these conversations and people are more starting to think about what kind but of are still still we should, but they are still so marginal. Yeah, it's, it's still right. so I, marginal. I was on the so, hopeful side of it. <laughs> so, so we, we will see. <laughs> but, yeah, but, but, but you know, if it's if it's exponential, if the growth is exponential, well, a, things a, things things can uh, things happen will take because off if, the, if you get an exponential growth curve, then all you need is a tipping point and boom, right? Yeah, <laughs> b- b- because the beautiful thing with exponential growth is that that during the first part, even if even if it's exponential, you don't notice it. Mm. And then all of a sudden you, you, uh, right. you, you start no- noticing a sudden, you right. start, start, it's a lot start of start momentum. Up. Once that thing yeah. gets hooked my, up, my, my, my favorite way of explaining yeah. exponential growth. And that goes back to my years in, in, mm-hmm. in, in, in physics is to say that, um, if you take 30 steps in a linear way forward, right. Okay. Then you end up at the end of the lecture hall. Right. Okay. If you take 30 steps exponentially, meaning that you double the right. size of your step every Excellent. time. Okay. Mm-hmm. 30 steps. Where will they take you? That's my first question. And what right. would you guess? Uh, I mean, the, the linear one at the end of the lecture hall, what's the yeah. exponential one? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh God, uh, across the state. <laughs> no, to the moon. Now 30 on, oh God. Okay. 30 there. steps exponentially that takes you to the moon. But that was the first question. Uh-huh. The second question is, Okay, with exponential growth, where are you after 10 steps? Right, and just and, on the street. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You are still in the block. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's the trick. I mean, the, the exponential growth is not, it's not something that happens later. Right. Yeah, but still with exponential growth, you're still in the block. And we can see this a little bit in the pandemic mm-hmm. with, with the uh, ep- uh, epidemiologists Mm-hmm. sort of knowing that we have exponential growth. Right. And when you are in a population and the virus is spreading and you're still within the 10 steps, mm-hmm. most people think this is nothing to worry about. Look at that. Not so much happening, but, but they know it's exponential and we are 10 steps, you know, right. after 20 and 30, you know, boom. Right, right. So, right. so Remember, again, right. 29 steps, you're halfway to the moon and the 30th <laughs> step, you're there. <laughs> exactly. So then again, going back to, to um, evolutionary psychology and how we got our mind and the way of interpreting the world, mm. we are fairly good as, as humans to interpret the world when it comes to, to linear things. Right. I mean, running after an animal and trying to throw a spear or something, it's all linear. But the exponential uh, phenomenon, we haven't developed any sort of intuitive uh, feeling mm-hmm. for, for, for that. And now that so many phenomena are exponential, that, that is... Uh, not helpful mm. that that we haven't got a natural feeling Amen. for that. So so let's hope that's my concluding remark. All let's right. let's hope that this awakening yes. is exponential and that we just passed step number ten. Amen. Amen. That's a beautiful comment. It gives us a nice arc uh, of this structure. Um, is there, as we then wrap up, is there anything that you'd like to leave the uh, listeners with? Or is there any place that we should find you? Anything we should put in the show notes for folks to follow up on at any level? No, I, I think that um, uh, ch- check out uh, the per- uh, Perspectiva Initiative in uh, in London, jo- Jonathan uh, Rosen. Yes. A, a, li- a link to to the website. Okay. Uh, another uh, initiative, uh, also under Perspectiva, but a little bit different, is the Emerge Initiative. Mm-hmm. Yes. With the URL whatisemerging.com right. mm-hmm. that we are, where we are trying to bring Hopefully people. It is. <laughs> yes, where we, where we are speculating around this, but also trying to gather people coming from very different uh, perspectives into this to to, to try to um, 
uh, find new ways of cooperating in this uh, emergent yes. in this emergent process. And then finally, of course, if you're interested, download the, the free app 29K mm. uh, and try out our digital platform for personal inner development and, and growth. Oh, beautiful. Okay. Mm. Well, thank hey, you. thank you so much for coming on and sharing your thank wisdom. You, it was really, really enjoyable to get your uh, perspective on all of this. <laughs> thank you. Okay.